I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb. Till I met you I was breathing But not Alive All my failures I tried To hide It was my tomb Till I met you you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. You called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness. Into your glorious day. Now your mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old made new. Jesus, when I met you, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day, you called my name, and I ran out of that grave. St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Wilmington, Delaware, and anyone else who may be listening in and watching us as we worship in ways that we need to worship during this crisis. We hope that you also, as well as our memberships, are friends of Jesus and deepening in your faith as we track through this uh, experience together. One announcement, really, and that is, is that the Lion, that is our newsletter, is coming out soon. Please watch uh, the information that's being communicated. It may be something you need to know about relative to things that are still going on, meetings that are held, classes that are held, and so forth. But most importantly, you need to know, and I think respect, that there are people at St. Mark's who are looking seriously 
at how we are going to open in a soft but sure and slow sense once we're allowed to do that. So watch what is coming out and you will be kept informed. And now we begin as we believe in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O God of glory, your Son Jesus Christ suffered for us and ascended to your right hand. Unite us with Christ and each other in suffering and in joy, that all the world may be drawn into your bountiful presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Uh, I need to uh, introduce you, if you have not yet met them, to Lenny. He's our new friend here. He's been around St. Mark's for a while. Leroy and Larry. They're all good friends. Larry has taught Lenny and Leroy how to talk sheep talk. And the two lions have taught Larry how to talk lion talk. And I've been trying to teach them how to talk people talk so that we can all communicate. And one day, not uh, long ago, actually several days ago, Lenny and Leroy were chatting about what's in the Bible. The book that we trust so much as Christian people to find out what God wants from us. And they concluded that God loves sheep more than God loves lions. And that's because sheep are mentioned more often, by far, in the Bible than lions are. So they finally went to Larry and said, Larry, does God love you more than God loves us? And Larry was really very special here. And he said, Lenny and Leroy, God loves you just as much as God loves me. God loves all the animals. I know that there are some animals in this day and age that are, and all through history, that are vicious. But God loves them. God created them. And there's purpose in all the animals of creation and all the other things of creation that God has made. But just as Larry has taught Lenny and Leroy that they're loved as much, we human beings, we people, need to re be reminded that God loves everybody, red and yellow, black and white, young, old, rich, poor, God loves everybody and none more than any other. That means that any other human being that you can name, whether it's your grandfather or mother or sister or brother or a stranger or even somebody who seems to be quite nasty, God loves them too. And we believe that Jesus, God's Son, died for them too. So just as Larry and Leroy and Lenny are all loved by God equally, so also God loves all of us equally. God does not love women more than men or men more than women or tall people more than short people or white people more than black people or Asian people more than Native American. God loves all people the same. Even though there's more about sheep in the Bible than there is about lions. It doesn't mean that God loves lions less. And just because there are certain things in the Bible that we would seem to take in a way that makes God look like he loves some more than others, it just is not true. The Bible tells us that God loves us all equally. Thank you. Larry and Leroy and Lenny will be with us again into the future, maybe next week, maybe into the weeks ahead, we'll see. The first reading is from the book of Acts. When the apostles had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, 
but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from the book of First Peter. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's sufferings, so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert, like a roaring lion your adversary, the devil, prowls around, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Easter. 
I've spoken previously about the number 50, which in biblical numerology means jubilee. Jubilee is an opportunity to start all over again, cleansed and redeemed from the past and correcting the injustices of the past. Read Leviticus 25 for the origins of Jubilee. We are in some ways in Jubilee now, uh, but we're not feeling it yet. So even as we suffer some, we need to know that Jubilee and joy are coming. The Gospel lesson today, John 17, 1 to 11, is a portion of Christ's high priestly prayer. One of only two times we get to listen in on the very prayers of Jesus. The other is in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, before Jesus is arrested. The prayer here is about the relationship between the Heavenly Father and Jesus, one of complete oneness or unity. Jesus prays that those who believe in him, his disciples throughout history, might be, quote, one as he and the Father are one, end of quote. Perhaps the greatest tragedy of Christian history is that the church remains as divided as we do. Christ's own prayer has not yet been answered. I want to opt to use as my text today, however, the second lesson, which is from the first letter of Peter. And before we jump into Peter's words, perhaps it is best that we pray. Heavenly Father, good, glorious, and gracious God, we thank you for allowing us still to meet during this viral crisis, even if we do so removed physically from each other. Enable us, however, to be spiritually one, united and knowing the bond of peace, willing and increasingly able to represent you in positive, loving, and uplifting ways to the world brought low by all kinds of forces, including right now, a virus. May our words to others, and if possible, our deeds, bring healing, helpfulness, and hope. We ask that we've been taught and invited to ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. As I have shared on previous occasions, there are various forms of suffering we can experience. First of all, we can suffer for what is right and just. If anything, there is probably not enough of that. Secondly, we can suffer for Christ. Probably not much of that either. Not in our day. And third, suffering because we live on a fallen planet. Of this, we tend to think there is far too much. In living on planet Earth, we can suffer from either consequence or coincidence. If you happen unknowingly to get the virus, even when taking appropriate and necessary precautions, that is coincidence. But it must be said that if you go out in public without a mask and don't keep social distance, you could get COVID-19, or give it to someone else. That is consequence. The suffering Peter speaks of here, however, is purely suffering because of Christ. We often incorrectly think of persecution as a common risk for early Christians everywhere. This was not true. Only during the reign of Emperor Diocletian in the late 3rd and early 4th centuries was persecution universal within the empire. Prior to that era, persecutions were regional and sporadic. Peter was writing at a time when persecutions could happen. It sounds as if indeed they were happening when he wrote. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. 1 Peter 4.12 On Sunday mornings, we are in the midst of a study on seven churches of Asia Minor as are recorded in Revelation 2 and 3. 
frequently in most of those congregations refusal to venerate the empire, emperor, excuse me, in some way, thought by Christians to be idolatry, guaranteed serious sanction. I must admit to becoming particularly upset with those who believe that saying Merry Christmas became forbidden, with those saying in any way being persecuted. I never stop saying Merry Christmas, even as I also have said Good Hanukkah to my Jewish friends. Rabbi Grumbacher says Merry Christmas to me and my family. We even exchange cards, Hanukkah cards and Christmas cards. Jesus warned us about straining for gnats and swallowing camels in Matthew 23:24. This Merry Christmas thing is a perfect example of such, and it's hardly persecutory. There were precious few Christians in Nazi Germany and their occupied territories who took the risk of saving Jews not just from persecution, but from annihilation. The greater masses of Christians in those territories either didn't care or were too afraid to act claiming they didn't know what was going on was pure nonsense. There are errors in Christian history when the Christians were the persecutors, as also in the Spanish Inquisition, and this is as sad as it gets. In our own day, literally right now, we are learning that COVID-19 is having proportionately far greater incidence and impact among people of color and on the poor. What is an appropriate and effective manner for Christians to speak out about and to act to mitigate this reality? Regardless of government action or inaction, are Christians in America and elsewhere willing to risk some sort of sanction or persecution precisely because Christ mandated us care for the vulnerable ones. It is a greater problem with us when we become indirectly perse persecutors. And ignoring the reality of the disparities going on right now in our society around the world is a deadly sin of omission. We quote, rejoice in so far as you are sharing Christ's sufferings. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory is resting upon you, 1 Peter 4, 14. Paul wrote the same thing in effect when he also invited Roman Christians to rejoice or boast in their sufferings, speaking specifically about suffering for Christ right there in the capital city of Rome. While not seeking to suffer, which would be a genuine sickness of spirit, there is something sacred about suffering, especially suffering for Christ and or suffering for what is right and just according to Christ. Perhaps the sanctity of suffering is most revealed in Peter's invitation to quote, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God so that he may exalt you in due time, 1 Peter 5, 6. Humility is the first of the seven saving virtues, just as pride is the first of the seven deadly sins. Especially Luke, the evangelist, employs these reversals, like those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The first shall be last, the last first, and so forth. There is that timing issue, again, in Christian understanding of God, namely that suffering, injustice, and the like may be the norm now, but the promise, patiently trusted, is coming when the Lord decides. Cast your anxiety on him, because he cares for you, Peter says. Discipline yourself, resist the devil, and after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace will himself restore support,
strengthen you and establish you. We're not in Christian teaching promise immunity from difficulty, danger, or disease. What we are promised is that in the midst of any of those, we are loved, cared about, and promised ultimate relief. In the meantime, and in the midst of whatever suffering we incur, especially for Christ, we are to rejoice. There's something holy in such suffering. There is sanctity in suffering. We do not, and indeed, must not go looking for suffering in order to know sanctity. Because as we are living for Christ, and living for what is right and just, suffering will come on its own. The world cannot stand through righteousness and justice, and all too often will not accept true love and care. Our purpose and our prayer is that the people of the world may come to see the sanctity of our suffering and rejoice with us in the Christ who suffered for everyone, everywhere. Amen. hope of healing and resurrection. We join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. O oh God, hear call your people to be one, as you are one. Unite your church in the truth of your gospel, the love of our neighbor, and the call to proclaim your reign to all people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Breathe life into your creation. Guide your people as we explore the mysteries of the universe. We pray for the work of scientists and mathematicians whose skill enriches our understanding. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Make your justice known among the nations of the earth. Protect the vulnerable. Redirect those who use violence and greed as weapons. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Come to the aid of your children. We pray for those engulfed in grief, those without supportive families, and for all who are isolated, powerless, or afraid, that all may rest their anxieties in your care. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As invited in instruction, we weep with those who weep, these days over whether individuals are personally experience, experiencing and over what we are all confronted with in the COVID-19 virus. A microscopic germ can bring nations to their knees and humble us all. For those mourning the loss of a loved ones, those afflicted with this or other diseases, those who have lost jobs and income, those who are afraid, Grant your healing presence and loving power. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
providing God, your gifts to us of first responders, doctors, nurses, lab and x-ray techs, and a custodians as well as clerks in other essential businesses are all people we cannot do without. We thank you and we thank them. Keep them safe, sane, and sustained in their service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give courage to all who embark on new ventures. We especially remember this day all who risked their lives to serve in our armed forces. Grant safety to those who are serving at home or abroad and assure them of your never failing strength. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Raise all your saints to eternal life. Until that day, we give you thanks for the faithful examples of those who have listened to your voice and now rest in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the privacy of this moment and in the silence of our hearts, we bring to you, O Lord, our personal prayer. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care. Through Christ our Lord, amen. The peace of Christ be with you all.
Jesus.